Hello, hello. We are continuing with our fourth session of female African-American entertainers, musicians, singers, and actresses that positively impacted the civil rights movement. And today's story is the lovely Lena Horne. She was gorgeous. And you can see why she made it all the way to Hollywood in a big screen. Um, her parents both had African-American, Native American, and European-American heritage. And so I think that her beauty comes from that combination, right? She was stunning, very trim, elegant, um, gorgeous dimples, as you could see in the picture. And she came from an interesting background. Her mother was an actress, and her father was a banker and part-time gambler. So they ended up divorcing when she was about three. And because her mother would travel with different troops as an actress, sometimes um, Lena would go with her. And most of the time, I'm thinking during the school year, she would stay with family or friends. And by the age of 16, sort of had her fill with it all, right? She was done with school. And she dropped out to begin singing at the Cotton Club in Harlem. I would have given anything to have been on that scene. I just, ugh, the best entertainers came through the Cotton Club, right? So she was a part of that, and she went on in 1934 um, to hit Broadway. Her debut was in Dance With Your Gods, and she started getting some attention. She began to sing with the Noble Sissel Orchestra under the name Helena Horn instead of Lena. So if you ever are um, looking through recordings, you will find her listed as Helena. She then did a musical Broadway review titled Lou Leslie's Blackbirds of 1939. Then she went on tour with Charlie Barnett Orchestra. This was an all-white orchestra. And much like we discussed with Billie Holiday yesterday, it proved very difficult. What would happen with black entertainers that went on tour with white entertainers is they often wouldn't have a place to sleep. So particularly if the band was able to be housed at the venue in which they had played. African Americans were not. So if she couldn't find a boarding house or some, a room to rent for the night, she may end up in a car. Um, a horrible, horrible situation, very frustrating. And for someone who's young and who has had a certain amount of success and has performed on Broadway and is a stunning beauty, you're thinking, I'm being treated like a second-class citizen. This isn't fun. I can't imagine the effects it has on your psyche, right? So she ended up leaving the orchestra. She went back to New York and in 1941 began performing regularly at the Cafe Society nightclub. Now, I mentioned this yesterday when I talked about Billie Holiday. In 1939, Billie was presented with a poem while she was performing. Um, at the same Cafe Society nightclub, and they wanted her to turn it into a song. And that poem about lynching turned into the very famous Strange Fruit. So that was in 1939 with Billy, and in 1941, Lena has made her way to the same place. So she's there, and she's singing to black and white artists. It was an integrated audience, and I imagine that would have been much more comfortable for her. Everyone would be appreciated for who they were, and she wouldn't have felt like a second-class citizen. She followed um, the Cafe Society up with a run at the Savoya Plaza Hotel nightclub, very elegant um, and prestigious, and she really started gaining some attention at this point. Life Magazine did a spread on her. And Hollywood soon came a-knockin', right? Because she was a stunner. She became the highest paid black entertainer of this era. So, 1943-44, she is the woman about town, right? And everyone in the black community is looking to her for representation and they wanted it to be positive. So MGM calls her, and they want to sign her to a seven-year contract. And her father, along with the NAACP, said, we're going with you. And so they go out there, and they go, they go through this contract together um, with a fine-tooth clone, and they make sure that she is not going to be required to take roles of a mamie or a prostitute, which was generally all that was offered to black women at that time. They wanted to be sure she wasn't pigeonholed. 
and they did a good job because if they hadn't been there, she would have been, and we probably never would have seen the real talent that she has on the big screen, right? So her first movie was um, Swings Cheer in 1943, and then in 1944, she did Broadway Rhythm. Both of these movies were integrated films, but what they did with Alina was they would have her do a solo number where she was singing and or dancing, because in the South at this time, theaters would cut out her performances. And if they hadn't done it this way, then the theater wouldn't have showed the film at all, right? So unfortunately, she's trying to set up a platform for the African American community to be depicted um, in a better, more positive light. And she's still running into the Jim Crow South, right? And often her scene would end up on the cutting room floor but at least she wasn't having to play a mammy or a prostitute, right? Now, during the same time, she did two films in 1943 that were all African-American cast, which means she could show all of her talents, not have to worry about them being cutting, cut out. Um, there were a lot of theaters in the South that didn't show these films, but that was okay. At least she didn't feel like she was being degraded right? So Cabin in the Sky and Stormy Weather were the two films that um, were all black cast and that's where her signature tune came from, Stormy Weather. I'm going to read you some of these lyrics. Um, as you know, we talked yesterday about Billie Holiday and I first heard this song off of a Billie Holiday album. So imagine my shot when I realized it was really Lena's tune and she had made it most famous, right? But it starts out, don't know why, there's no sun up in the sky, stormy weather, since my man and I ain't together. It keeps raining all the time. Life is bare, gloom and misery everywhere, stormy weather. Just can't get my poor self together. I'm weary all the time. So it was another one of those slow, sultry torch songs a blues ballad that a singer would love to milk and an audience would hang on to every word. Um, and she did it very, very well. And so that film probably brought that song more notoriety than anything had up until that point. So at this time, she still is feeling some backlash, right? And she starts getting more active in civil rights. Every time the NAACP has a rally, um, the National Council for Negro Women had a function, Lena started showing up and performing, and she became a very outspoken activist for the Civil Rights Movement. And she was one of the first entertainers to be so vocal um, and outspoken. Because as we talked about Marian Anderson the other day, Marion would show up and sing, and she had a clause in her contract that said she would not um, sing to segregated audiences, but she would never answer questions posed by um, reporters about incidents that would happen. And Lena would talk about it, right, when nobody else had had the guts to do it up until that point. So she went on with her career during this time to still do more singing, but less film. And the reason why is because we have the McCarthy era. She had become active in a group that was associated with communism. Whether she was really leaning in that direction, we don't know. What we do know is that she had a really good friend um, who helped her out, who was active. And his name was Paul Robeson. Um, Paul made a point to try to protect her as much as possible, career-wise, um, as well as on a personal level, while sort of supporting her in being an activist. It was a, a tough rope um, to walk, certainly. And she was living in Hollywood in a very nice neighborhood all of the neighbors came together to try to throw her out of her home. 
because she wasn't white. And Paul came to her rescue and they used the NAACP and managed to save her home so that she didn't have to leave it. Um, it was a very tough time for her, a lot of back and forth. So she ended up being blacklisted in Hollywood because of her affiliation with Paul. And it was the Progressive Citizens of America. Um, that was the name of the organization that they tried to say was a communist organization. So she had also throughout the 40s, and this didn't help her situation, made a point of suing different restaurants and theaters that were showing outright racism, okay? There was one situation in particular that was big headline news. She had performed to soldiers during World War II overseas, and she was mortified because she's on stage, and all the soldiers in the front are white, and then there were prisoners of war, and then behind the prisoners of war were the African-American soldiers that were serving in World War II. And she was beyond mortified. She was pissed. And she reached out to the NAACP and said, we need to file a lawsuit because this is not acceptable. And she was right. She was 100% right. But America wasn't ready for it yet, you know? So all of these things combined sort of caused her to be blacklisted and kept her from being in films for almost a decade, okay? So later she went um, on just to do performances in posh nightclubs across Europe and the United States to make a living during this interim. Then by the 1950s, the band started to ease up a little bit. Um, she returned to the movie screen somewhat. She had a 1956 film called Meet Me in Las Vegas. She recorded two albums in 55 and 57. Uh, the first was It's Love that had a hit single, Love Me or Leave Me, and Stormy Weather in 1957, which did very well. She had a live recording at the Waldorf Astoria um, that made her the top selling female vocalist with RCA. So that was very successful for her. So she's still selling albums. People are still listening to her. Um, and it helps her work her way back. She did a musical called Jamaica that ran from 1957 to 15, um, 1959 on Broadway. And in 1963, she participated in the March on Washington. If you guys watched my first few segments of this mini lecture, everybody was there. Marian Anderson was there. Nina Simone was there. Billie Holiday would have been there, but she passed away in 59. So there were a lot of entertainers that participated in that March on Washington. And that was the day that Martin Luther King gave the famous I Have a Dream speech. So following that, um, in 1965, she made an album called Feeling Good. And in 66, did Lena in Hollywood. Both of those did well. Then in 1970, she had a bit of a rough patch personally. Um, she lost her father, her brother, and someone else very close to her all within like two years. And she really pulled back from the public eye, and it took her a while to process her grief. Um, in 1973, she joined Tony Bennett on tour. Um, they had a beautiful friendship, and she toured with him in 1974 as well and did some TV appearances during this time. So things slowed down for her after that. By 1981, she did her own Broadway show titled The Lady and Her Music, and it ran for 14 months and was extremely successful. Um, I believe there was a biography put out with that same title as well. And she had done her own memoirs in the 50s early on that was just called Lena. So you have a couple of books you can read about her if you are a reader, right? and followed those up with U.S. and European tours. So she had a very long career. She received a Drama Desk Award, um, a Special Tony Award. She received two Grammys in her lifetime. In 1994, she did a New York Supper Club concert that was recorded and released as An Evening with Lorna. And this was the last big thing that she ever did. Um, and that won a Grammy for Best Jazz Vocal Album. So she held her own for a long time. I want to talk about 
her personal life a little more so that you can have an idea of how racism and, and prejudice in America affected her, her personal life and certainly was detrimental to her overall quality of life, right? She married first a man named Louis Jones, and they were married from 1937 to 1944, and they had two children, and then they got divorced. And she married a man um, named Lenny Hayton in December of 1947, and he was a white band leader. And they married in Paris, France, to be out of the American eye, and they hid it from the public for three years. And rightly so, because Lorna knew there would be a huge backlash, and she was trying to correct, um, protect her career and her marriage, right? It had a horrible effect. Lots of headlines, just really derogatory negative stuff that cost her that relationship. They ended up getting separated in the 60s. They never got divorced. Um, I think they really loved each other and it was just a tragic horrible situation and I want everyone that's watching this to think about the fact that for a long long time we as a culture expected um, our African-American entertainers to make us happy and please us while they were treated horribly okay I don't think many of us could have handled it as well as she did and other entertainers did. And I think that she could, should be commended for her courage and her bravery and her activism um, for maintaining an elegance in the worst of situations. Um, there was a video I watched the other day that had been aired on PBS and it interviewed her and the conversation came around to how racism had affected her career, especially her Hollywood career. And she didn't hold any punches. I mean, she stated very frankly, she said, the year was 1990 when this interview took place. And she said, I'm just disgusted and angry that it's still going on. She said, I'm still hearing the same kind of stories today of things that were happening in the 40s and 50s. She said, nothing's changed. And then she said, but you know, when I talk to my daughter about this, she'll tell you that things aren't as bad as they used to be. And her children, my grandchildren, will tell you that they're getting a little better. And in the interview, she said, maybe with every generation, it does get somewhat better, but I'm still angry that we are not past this. And I think she did a very um, eloquent job in stating that because we should be past it, because she worked hard to fight against it. Um, and I imagine that's only frustrating to see that all of your hard work, everything that you sacrifice, the loss of a marriage, taking hits in your career you should have never had to have taken, um, trying to do the right thing and lead the way towards the light and still having people just turning their head to the dark, right? But she certainly did her part. She has nothing to be ashamed of. In 2009, there was a biography put out called Stormy Weather. The memoir that I mentioned earlier named Lena that she wrote was released in 1965. And the lovely Lena Horn left us of heart failure on May 9th, 2010. And she died in her home um, in her sleep in New York. So if you have not seen any of her movies, I think that's the best way to hear her voice and see her singing and get an idea of everything that she brought to the table regarding entertainment. So go back to some of those lovely musicals um, of the golden era of Hollywood, if you will, and take a look at Lena Horne. Let her knock your socks off, because she will. <laughs>